Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Rebecca Rand. In our top story, Israel has detected 28 new Hezbollah missile sites in civilian areas in and around Beirut, Lebanon. These rockets are strategically placed next to hospitals, schools, and restaurants. The Alma Research Education Center, which discovered the locations, explained that by placing their launch sites near public buildings, educational institutions, and factories, Hezbollah is using the population of Beirut as human shields. The Iranian-backed terror group has an arsenal of more than 130,000 missiles of various ranges and payloads. The report noted that almost all of the sites are located in the southern part of the Lebanese capital, in civilian neighborhoods, inside private homes, medical centers, churches, industrial facilities, public offices, fast food chains, and in nearby open spaces. In effect, forcing residents to serve as human shields. The Palestinian Authority is desperately trying to stop Israel from extending sovereignty throughout Judea and Samaria, even if it means silencing their own people. Several Palestinians who voice their support for Israel to extend its control of the Jewish heartland have been arrested by the Palestinian Authority, which is notorious for the torture of Arabs it considers collaborators with Israel. These Palestinians were filmed by hidden cameras, expressing their hope for Israel to declare sovereignty. Several of them said that they want out of the corrupt Palestinian Authority and that they hope to become citizens of Israel one day. What is likely most troubling to the PA is video footage of several Arabs saying that they do not view Israelis as enemies. Families of the people who were interviewed claim that their relatives were arrested by Palestinian police several weeks ago when the footage aired. Most of the Natanz nuclear facility in Iran was destroyed in a recent attack that is being attributed to Israel. Satellite imagery shows major damage to the site where the radical Islamic regime was assembling highly advanced atomic centrifuges. Experts believe that the centrifuge center at the enrichment location has suffered significant, extensive, and likely irreparable damage to its main assembly hall. These experts estimate that 75% of the laboratory in Natanz was destroyed. And in a related story, Israel's successful launch of the OFEC-16 reconnaissance satellite has provided Jerusalem with an eye in the sky over Tehran. Israel is already receiving high-resolution pictures from OFEC and is poised to prevent Iran from making any further progress on its rogue nuclear program. Several Arabic-language news sites have reported that the most senior naval commander of Hamas was working for Israel and has defected. The naval division of the Iz ad-Din al-Qasim Brigade is said to be the terror organization's most classified unit. According to reports, the most senior commander of this division recently fled the Gaza Strip in a boat full of Israeli commandos with a laptop, highly sensitive documents, and surveillance equipment. This is the second high-level Hamas commander to be recently accused of working with Israel. The terror group believes that an operator in charge of the communications networks in Gaza City had been passing intel to Jerusalem since 2009. The revered Israeli Mossad intelligence agency has foiled several attempted attacks on embassies throughout Europe and elsewhere. According to a report released by Israel's Channel 12 television, Jerusalem's diplomatic missions were the target of Iranian terrorists. Tehran is reportedly reeling after numerous acts of sabotage have literally rocked the country's nuclear infrastructure, and the Ayatollah is looking for a way to get back at Jerusalem. Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen have fired ballistic missiles at Saudi Arabia. The FARS Iranian news agency claimed that the proxy army fired four rockets and launched seven weaponized drones. Riyadh did confirm that it intercepted several missiles. Iranian news reported that the drones attacked King Khaled Air Base, about 100 kilometers from the Saudi border with Yemen. The Houthi rebels are using drones with advanced Iranian technology to infiltrate deeper into Saudi territory and instigate a conflict with the monarchy. The newly re-elected president of Poland has doubled down on the country's refusal to take any responsibility for the Holocaust or to make reparations to Polish Jews for property seized during the Second World War. Before the war, Poland was home to a thriving but persecuted Jewish community. Most of the Jews of Poland were murdered in concentration camps. Rather than taking responsibility for its role in aiding the Nazi genocide, Poland is the only country in the European Union 
that has refused to pass legislation for compensation of private property confiscated by the Nazis or Poles during the Holocaust. This issue caused a diplomatic rift when Warsaw passed a law making it illegal to accuse Poland of complicity in Nazi war crimes. 50% of Swiss Jews reported experiencing anti-Semitism at some point over the last five years. Switzerland is home to about 18,000 Jews. Many of them have been targeted by anti-Semitic abuse. This recent study conducted by the Zurich University of Applied Sciences in Switzerland follows a governmental study which reflects that one in 10 residents of Switzerland holds negative views of Jewish people. Swiss Jews report being attacked in the streets and on campuses, and they say they are afraid to wear identifying symbols such as kippahs and the Star of David. Tehran has admitted that a communications problem and an improperly aligned missile battery were responsible for shooting down a Ukrainian passenger plane in January. Iran's civil aviation organization released a report citing a number of factors which led to the downing of the jetliner and the deaths of all 176 people on board. The incident occurred on the same night that the rogue Islamic Republic launched a missile attack on U.S. troops in Iraq. Despite Tehran's repeated denials of wrongdoing, Western authorities presented evidence proving that an Iranian rocket destroyed the airliner. A student at Israel's Institute of Technology at the Technion in Haifa has developed a soft polymer that could be used as self-healing skin. The material is waterproof and elastic and can fuse itself back together if torn, cut, scratched, or twisted. Mohammed Khatib invented the e-skin for use in a range of applications, including robotics and prosthetics. Tel HaShomer's Sheba Medical Center has begun trials of their new cancer neutralizing protocol. The therapy called reverse personalized medicine requires doctors to identify a patient's gene or characteristic and then match the right protocol to that patient. Much of the treatment relies on immunotherapy. It harnesses the patient's own immune system, which is the best personalized medicine in the fight against cancer. Professor Gal Markel, director of the Ella Limmelbaum Institute for Immuno-Oncology at Sheba Medical Center, told the Jerusalem Post that this novel methodology represents a sea of chains for traditional standards of care and offers the potential for achieving much better clinical outcomes with fewer treatment side effects. The unemployment rate in Israel fell by half in the month of June. The Jewish state has been hit hard by the second wave of the coronavirus and many were shocked to see that over 450,000 Israelis were turned to work in June. Israel's Central Bureau of Statistics reported that unemployment was cut in half, falling from 21% at the end of May to 10.7% in June. The Israeli Antiquities Authority has announced the discovery of a 2,500-year-old clay seal from the time of the Babylonian exile. The ancient artifact gives context to an otherwise black hole in Israeli archaeology known as the Persian period. Dr. Yiftak Shalev of the IAA compared the discovery to lighting a candle which helps to illuminate this mysterious period in Jerusalem's history. The impressions on the clay seal depict the rebuilding of the holy city after the destruction of the temple and the exile of the Jewish people. We are living in mysterious yet miraculous times. We've witnessed the most remarkable fulfillment of biblical prophecy, the Jewish people's return to Israel, and the prosperity and contributions of this tiny country in such a short time. Yet we've also seen an unexpected rise in anti-Semitism, which takes the form of anti-Zionism, and alliances between groups that are fighting against the most fundamental biblical values. In the book, Titus, Trump, and the Triumph of Israel, Josh Reinstein answers important questions to clarify what has driven political action from the time that the Roman Emperor Titus destroyed Jerusalem until today, when President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Get your copy today and learn how faith-based diplomacy has changed the world. To order your advanced copy, go to triumphofisrael.com.
That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest is Israel Rosenberg. He's a celebrated author here in Jerusalem. Israel, thank you for being on the show. Josh, thank you so much for having me. All right, the new book that just came out is called Isaiah. Tell us a little about it. Well, Isaiah is a book about the Jewish understanding of the book of Isaiah. Because I work at the Western Wall Tunnels, and I guide people, and I meet many, many Christians from America, and they often ask me, how do you understand Isaiah 53, the Virgin, all these kinds of things. And I've explained it to them enough until I got to the point where I realized it was time to write a book about it. It's interesting, in the book you actually talk about the Jewish concept of Messiah. There's not a lot of information of that out there, what Jewish actually believes will happen when the Messiah comes. Can you tell us a little about that? Oh, absolutely. The most important thing I tell the Christians that I meet and ask me about this is that for us, the Messiah is not a divine angel with wings and, and trumpets and cherubs and things like that. The Messiah for us is a leader, a very special political, I put it in, someone said to me when I told them that, you're not talking about a politician, are you? <laughs> but no, I'm, it's not a politician, a leader. And in our tradition, the world will be very much the same when the Messiah comes as it was before, but we will have an exceptional leader who will be able to pull together rather than push apart people, who will bring peace rather than war, who will bring understanding rather than division. And that's the kind of Messiah that our tradition teaches that we should be waiting for. A lot of people say, what happens if we don't recognize the Messiah? There's been a lot of false messiahs in the past. What is the Jewish uh, way of knowing that this is actually the Messiah? Well, it's a very important point. There is no such thing as the Messiah until we have what's called a Sanhedrin, that is to say a, a body, a legal religious body that would determine that, and we have to have a prophet that would determine that this individual, in fact, is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. So there's actually a certification process. Until then, if anyone says he's the Messiah, don't believe him. Now, there's another big question that comes up. Let's say the Messiah is here. What do Jewish people believe will happen on earth? Well, it's very interesting. Um, much of what the Messiah is supposed to do has actually already happened. And this is why Christians are so interested in Israel today. Because we have the ingathering of the exiles. We have the recreation of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. The land of Israel, says Ezekiel, will give forth its fruits to the Jewish people once again. And that has happened in many lifetimes. Of the, 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 the people we know have seen these things actually happen. So the background has already happened. Israel will assume a new position in the world as a nation, like, like I said, as a nation. Not, we're not talking about individuals. We're talking about a national entity that will bring peace and prosperity and understanding to the whole world. So that's really what we're talking about. A lot of people think that we're living in the end times. Uh, they also point to this coronavirus pandemic that's all around the world. Millions have it already today right. as, a, as proof of end times. What's the Jewish perspective? That's a fantastic question because I don't know the answer. I do know, and I think everybody knows, that something very special is going on with this corona thing. People have re rediscovered their families. They've rediscovered having dinner with their, with, their, with, with their intimate ones rather than running around all the time. It's preparing for something, but I don't think anyone out there knows really what it means in the long, in the long term. I've heard uh, uh, in Jewish families in the last two couple months more about the Messiah than I've probably heard in the last 10 years. A lot of people are talking about the Messiah, if the Messiah is going to come, if the Messiah is coming now. There was a rabbi 800 years ago that said that when the Jewish people have to celebrate Passover in their homes and they can't leave their homes, right. that will be the sign of the Messiah. Why do you think so much talk of Messiah now? I think the real reason is because unlike the previous things you mentioned briefly, you mentioned about some false messiahs that were in our history, we, the table is set, meaning everything is ready to go. We have an army, we have an, uh, we have an economy, we have education and health. Israel is reestablished in the land of Israel and the land itself is responding to the Jewish people returning to Israel as the prophets said it would. So, like I say, the table is set and 
things are waiting, and that's why people feel it. In other words, the Talmud also discusses the idea that before the Messiah comes, there'll be echoes of the fact that he's coming. We'll already get a sense that he's coming. So that's why people feel it, because it's actually happening. There was a feeling like this, though, just decades ago with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Uh, a lot of people thought that the Schneerson was the Messiah. There's still a small following that believes that. Why was there so much confusion then, if it's so clear when the Messiah comes? Well, the issues of, of the Rebbe being the Messiah are complicated. And not everyone agreed with that at all. In fact, there was quite a bit of opposition. Um, it's not simple. And we don't see, there's nobody on the horizon, there's no leader. The kind of leader that we're talking about is one, like I said, who will actually appeal to all the different sides of the spectrum and bring people together with a single idea. And that doesn't exist yet. But again, that anticipation is what people are feeling. A lot of people talking about Isaiah as well. Uh, they just found at Ir David, the city of David, the seal of Isaiah, they believe. Uh, how important is it that people understand that Isaiah was a real person, not someone from you know, a mystical history, but a real, actual person that lived? This is a wonderful question, because in my new book, I actually know the archaeologists who have discovered these, these seals. And there's, like anything in Judaism, there are people who say, nah, it's not a seal. But one archaeologist described to me like this. He says, if it looks like a duck and it sounds like a duck, it's probably a duck. Meaning, that seal says, le -yeshi le -le ha -navi. the last letter is missing. So people dispute whether, that's, whether it means Isaiah the prophet or not. I think it is. And to understand that Isaiah was not only a prophet who lived and breathed and walked the streets of Jerusalem, which is what my book talks about, but also was part of the family of King Hezekiah and was part of the family of our Mashiach. In other words, the Jewish Mashiach is an actual leader, a king. And the, 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 throughout the generations, the, the descendants of David who led Israel, they weren't all great. And we had problems with them, but they were officially what we call the Messiah, the anointed ones. So he actually had contact, close contact, with a real example of what the Messiah might be like. Former member of Knesset Yehuda Glick likes to say that you need a lot of faith to be an atheist today. Uh, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of people coming back to their faith. How right. much impact will that have on the story of Israel? That's fascinating because the Talmud teaches a couple of things. One of the things it teaches is that the whole Messiah process comes in two phases. The first phase is what we call in Hebrew, bisus, the establishment of the, of the infrastructure of the Jewish people existing in the land of Israel and functioning there. But we're not yet spiritually enlightened. That spiritual enlightenment will be something that will come with the Mashiach, according to one explanation. So we have this, the first phase, everyone sees it. Look at Israel, it's a tiny country, and it survived against all odds, and it not only has survived, it's thrived. And it's leading the world. They just announced yesterday that we have dis dis discovered uh, certain medications that work against the coronavirus, and that's gonna be replicated for people to use. So that's Israel now, but there's another level, and that is what you just said. Israel will become a place where spirituality will be the norm rather than the exception. And all of Israel isn't, when I say Israel, I don't mean not the country. All of the people of Israel are intended by the Torah to be a spiritual people to essentially serve the rest of the nations. And that's the idea that, that Christians sense but don't really have any proof of. And that's the, one of the things my book talks about. Israel, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? What I'd like to say to you folks is your senses that something is brewing, something big is happening, are true and real. And I want you to know that you should be expecting good things to happen to the nation of Israel and to the entire world. Thank you, Israel, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod.
Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Hayesod, United Israel Appeal. I'm Sam Grunwerk, World Chairman of Karen Hayesod, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. After 2,000 years, we found the descendants of the lost tribe of Dan. Please help us welcome our brothers and sisters back home. God bless you from Jerusalem. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Isaiah 11:12. Christians and Jews have been bearing witness to the miraculous fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Since the reestablishment of the State of Israel in 1948, the ingathering of the Jewish people to the Holy Land has unfolded before our very eyes. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Isaiah 43.5 Today, Karen Haisod has been tasked with completing one of the greatest examples of the fulfillment of this prophecy, the Aliyah of the Ethiopian Jews, the descendants of the tribe of Dan. On October 29, 2012, we were able to bring 250 new immigrants from Ethiopia to Israel. Karen Haisod is not only tasked with paying the costs of their flights and accommodations, but also with their absorption into Israeli society. There are still around 2,000 Ethiopian Jews who pray daily to come back to the land of Israel, and we need your help to bring them home. We are reaching out to our Christian brothers and sisters and asking you to join us. In this new century, as in the old, Christians must reach out to the Jewish people and do their part to advance the fulfillment of the prophecy and defend the covenant. Help us bring the children of Israel back to the land of Israel. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Genesis 12.3 בכל פעם שנפרדנו, הייתי אומר לכם שיגיע הרגע וניפגש בארץ ישראל. אחי ואחיותיי, הרגע הגיע. מעומק ליבי אני מאחל לכם ברוכים הבאים למולדת. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, we're expecting a massive wave of Aliyah from Jewish communities all around the world. Help us bring them home, and let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, visit khisrael.org. Thank you all for what you're doing, Christian and Jews alike. You stand up for our rights. You know that we're here because of a deep historical connection to our homeland, because of our history, because of our faith, because of our past, and because of our future. You say that with pride, not only unabashedly, but with pride. And I am proud of your pride. I think in today's world, with the convulsions that we see around us, Israel stands out as a beacon of democracy and hope and modernity. But we are able to do all this in this land because we know we're rooted here and we know what we stand for. But we stand with you and with uh, friends none better than you. I have to say that uh, in all the world, as I look around, I don't think we have better friends. I know that uh, often you stand there in the breach. I appreciate it. 
I value it, as do the people of Israel. Thank you all, and keep it up. I'm sure many of you have heard the claim that Jewish communities in Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, are an obstacle to peace. I've always been perplexed by this notion because no one would seriously claim that the nearly two million Arabs living inside Israel, that they're an obstacle to peace. That's because they aren't. On the contrary, Israel's diversity shows its openness and readiness for peace. Yet the Palestinian leadership actually demands a Palestinian state with one precondition, no Jews. There's a phrase for that. It's called ethnic cleansing. And this demand is outrageous. It's even more outrageous that the world doesn't find this outrageous. Some otherwise enlightened countries even promote this outrage. Ask yourself this, would you accept ethnic cleansing in your state, a territory without Jews, without Hispanics, without blacks? Since when is bigotry a foundation for peace? At this moment, Jewish school children in Judea, Samaria are playing in sandboxes with their friends. Does their presence make peace impossible? I don't think so. I think what makes peace impossible is intolerance of others. Societies that respect all people are the ones that pursue peace. Societies that demand ethnic cleansing don't pursue peace. I envision a Middle East where young Arabs and young Jews learn together, work together, live together, side by side, in peace. Our region needs more tolerance, not less. So the next time you hear someone say, Jews can't live somewhere, let alone in their ancestral homeland, take a moment to think of the implications. Ethnic cleansing for peace is absurd. It's about time somebody said it. I just did. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. The biblical prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. The people of Israel are returning to the Promised Land after 2,000 years of exile. But millions of Jews are still longing to come home. Anti-Semitism threatens many of the Jews. We must rescue them before the window of opportunity slams shut. Bless Israel by supporting Karen Hayasod United Israel Appeal, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Together, we can fulfill the prophecy of the Bible. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan Elrod. And I'm Rebecca Rand, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your Israel updates. <laughs>